Manhattan, Hollywood, Milwaukee. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Business Plays. This is the creatively named Corporate Darwin Awards Part de, because uh, Part 1 did really well. I mean, sort of. As soon as uh, it got like a few hundred thousand views, which is maybe double what this show normally gets. And always when it gets this many views, it gets more dislikes. I think it's got like, I mean, it's only like 5% down, but that's way more than normal. And that's because it's appealing to a wider base of people who've never seen Business Plays before and wonder what the f is going on. Well, if you're new here, which you might well be statistically because, you know, part two is going to do well because part one did well. This is Business Blaze. My name is Simon. I'm also known as your boy with the blaze. Unfortunately, that's a meme that's stuck. Danny writes us a script. I read it and I add some unfunny jokes and then Sam adds some memes. Let's just jump into it because you're already confused. That's okay, Peter. I just say that to freak out everyone new who's called Peter watching. I'm not really watching you, Peter. Or am I? One of the main reasons why, also, I need to clean my print heads apparently because there's a white line through this line and four others on this page. It was cock. It's cock actually, right? One of the main reasons why too many film franchises and TV shows end up becoming deeply unsatisfying experiences because nobody ever seems quite sure they're meant to be coming back to make some more. Some TV shows take the optimistic route and finish off a season with a thl thrilling cliffhanger ending, which makes it all the more frustrating when it fails to get recommissions. Oh my god, I just finished watching the TV show called Colony on Netflix. And I'm like, it's the last episode, and I know it's finished because they last made it in 2017 or whatever. And I'm finishing it, and I'm like, boy, they've got a lot to wrap up before the end of the before the series ends. And then I'm like halfway through the finale, and I'm like, they're not wrapping this up, are they? And it just ends on a massive cliffhanger, and that's it. F**k you, whoever made that TV show. Daddy, chill. Over the years, I've invested hours of my life into watching stuff like the 2009 reboot of the classic sci-fi show V, with the devious alien lizards disguised as humans. Just as things were starting to get really interesting, the plug was pulled, and I was just left feeling as if I'd read the first half of a massive book which the author couldn't be asked to finish. The flip side of the coin is that some films might furnish us with a very clear and definitive resolution, only to find that half of the cast of dead characters need to be clumsily resurrected for an unexpected sequel. Or you can just do what Lost did. Anyone remember that show Lost that was really good and then the ending was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Wait, so were they dead or were they not dead? I don't understand. I just feel like they made that show and they were like, how do we make a TV show? Well, we have lots of unanswered questions and cliffhangers because that'll keep people watching. And I just have the strong feeling they had absolutely no idea what they were doing. And they were like, no, no, no. We've known from the start. Don't fucking lie. Allegedly. Maybe Steven Spielberg. Oh, by the way, if you've smashed the dislike button already, please head over to perchthemerch.co. And, uh, and perch the merch. Maybe Steven Spielberg would have left the shark alive at the end of the original Jaws if it had any inkling that the studio were intent on churning out a string of increasingly preposterous follow-ups. I think that it's a shame that Jaws, the animated series, never got the green light, though. I don't think it's a shame, Danny. It's okay. I've never seen Jaws, by the way. Add it to the pantheon of movies that I've never watched. The reason I bring this up now is because Business Blaze recently posted a one-off standalone video on the Corporate Darwin Awards in which we counted down the ultimate examples of business owners who selflessly did the whole world a favor by destroying their own products and services with one ridiculous mistake and removing themselves from the corporate gene pool. We reached the end. We blew up the shark. And then Simon decided we should do a sequel. Look, Danny, I'm driven like the same guys who make the movies. You know, financially. <laughs> that sounds so creatively bankrupt, but it's true. Look, I mean, if this one does well as well, you can believe that we're going to be doing Corporate Darwin Awards Part 7, and then I'll eventually spin it off into a separate channel. Let me know if that's a good idea. Use the comments. At first, this seemed to be quite unfortunate, as I was fully prepared to move on to exploring fresh and exciting topics, such as the incredible success story behind Rage Shadow. Shadow Legends. Oh, I got a story to share with you about Raid. Um, so Raid Shadow Legends, for those, no, I'm just kidding. Everyone knows what Raid Shadow Legends is. They email me for sponsorship every week. And obviously they've never seen the show because I sh on them constantly, allegedly. And so I just got sick of saying no interest, no interest, no interest to all of their emails. Eventually, I was like, yeah, 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 I'll do a spot for you. And it'll cost you. I don't think I should say the amount because, well, it, let's just say it was absurdly high. <laughs> like it was high, high, well into the five figures. And I was like, um, yeah, that's one spot. And I'll, I'll guarantee you 100,000 views and I want complete 
creative control because in my mind, I'm like, oh boy, this is gonna be sarcastic. And they come back to me and they're like, that's a little high. Could you meet us at this number? Which was also absurdly high. And I was like, nah. <laughs> Raid Shadow Legend! Oh my god, we should get on with this. It's been like five minutes and we're really not even into the content. This is why people smash the dislike button. No shit. Oh, shut your face! Cockwumble. The developers promised me 15 grand if I could slip that reference into the script just so long as Simon doesn't say anything sarcastic about it immediately afterwards. But the good news is that uh, it turns out the corporate world is full of idiots. So I've managed to come up with five more examples of business that recklessly self-imploded without the risk of the blaze jumping a long line of progressively improbable sharks oh look danny i mean this show jumped the jumped the shark on about the fifth episode the only people watching are like the hardcores sears loses the internet and thank you thank you it's i, I really do appreciate it because i have the most fun making this channel and it's insane to me that i get paid to do it you legends sears loses the internet this is a controversial entry to kick off proceedings largely because the story of the rise and fall of sears is a long and complicated one with many twists and turns. And it could be argued that the company's biggest business mistake wasn't entirely their fault, and they're still around today. In fact, it could be argued that the Sears story doesn't fit the criteria for the corporate Darwin Awards at all. Oh god, Danny. What, when people smashing the dislike button, one, because I do a 10 minute introduction before I actually get to any good content, and two, because this is about the corporate Darwin Awards, and Danny's leading story is one that doesn't meet the criteria. <laughs> Danny, what the fuck, man? Look, um, it's okay if you turn off now. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Not really. Let's carry on. But stick with me for a second. Okay, Danny. Just because you asked nicely. Because there's an important point to be made here on how online shopping could have looked very different if Sears hadn't pressed the self-destruct button too quickly. Originally founded in Chicago back in 1883, Sears Roebuck & Co., now more commonly known as simply Sears, started life as a small mail order company selling watches and jewelry. Following a hundred years, years of successful expansion and diversification, Sears had pretty much evolved into the early offline version of Amazon and was the largest retailer in the United States by far for a while, accounting for 1% of the entire US economy. Wow, that changed. It's like Sears. I'm not even sure what it is. I feel like it, I thought it was a department store. Although thousands of Sears stores have cropped up across the states, it was the legendary Sears mail order catalog that remained at the heart of the business for the best part of a century. And it was still pulling in about four billion dollars per year in the 1980s. You could pretty much order any old shit you wanted from there, in much the same way that you can from Amazon today. If zebra sex masks, that's an OG business blaze legend joke right there, you could bet your life that you'd be able to find one on the one and a half thousand pages of the Sears catalog. However, Sears was starting to lose a bit of momentum by the 1990s and Walmart and Kmart had pushed them down to third place. But, there's always a but, the good news is that internet shopping was just around the corner and Sears was perfectly poised to take advantage of the oncoming rise of the e-commerce platform. I've never heard of Sears selling sh** online. They definitely haven't expanded their international presence like Amazon has everywhere, so I'm guessing this doesn't go according to plan. They already had the difficult bits of the network and infrastructure in place. Unlike their competitors, Sears had the massive customer base with the mail order catalog, tens of thousands of employees toiling away in warehouses that ran like clockwork, the shipping systems and the huge distribution network, the clout with vendors, and a guy called Dave who worked in the car park. Never forget Dave, he's critical to, uh, <laughs> to the success of Sears. All they really had to do was shift their catalog online and they would have become Amazon years before Jeff Bezos came up with the... I heard someone pronouncing his name Bezos the other day, and I was like, is that right? How do you say that? And uh, it doesn't matter. Came up with the idea of flogging taddy old books from his garage. Easy peasy. Sadly for Sears, the company decided to take a different route. They placed much more emphasis on the physical stores, and in 1993, they discontinued the mail order catalog altogether, axing the entire infrastructure along with 50,000 jobs. Mistake! Hey, Lois, how about we try Sears? They got good stuff. Peanut, nobody's been in Sears for decades. Oh, come on. When I was a boy, we always used to go clothes shopping at Sears. Trust me, they'll have everything I need. What the hell is even that? 
By the time they realized they may have dropped a bit of a clangor with this approach, Amazon was already gaining ground and, and Sears had to start again from scratch. Today, Sears is just about surviving, but only by the skin of its teeth. The former biggest retailer in the United States had now dropped to 57th place. That is brutal. And Sears filed for bankruptcy in 2018. That is double brutal. And I have learned recently on business plays that bankruptcy doesn't mean that you go away forever. I'd be like, yeah, bankrupt. So, so you're done. I mean, surely someone's going to at least buy the brand name Sears and do something with it. It just turns out like it seems to be just an accounting ploy, business ploy of some kind, so you don't have to pay people or something like that. Pretty sketchy. I mean, bankruptcy is good for business. But why can companies go bankrupt like eight times? I feel like after that, they'd be like, no. Fuck you. Uh, the company plans to continue on a vastly reduced scale with a whole wave of store closures announced this very month. So I actually looked into purchasing uh, old, like, you know, if Sears actually went out of business and no one wanted it anymore, the Sears trademark can come up for sale. And I wanted to, I was like, oh, you know, the Enron, I have my Enron mug, which I don't have today. And I was like, can you buy like the Enron trademark? And it turns out some company that made t-shirts had actually bought the Enron trademark. And I was like, you legend. I want to buy something like that. Some old company that's sketchy as fuck, like Theranos. I'd like to buy the trip. Maybe we could have like a uh, what's it called? Um, not a Kickstarter, but where you get where you raise money for like buying something. I'd love to own like officially own the Theranos brand just for f**ks and giggles. Some people, and then I'd have a whole range of Theranos merch. Some people have speculated that Sears has con had considered the internet to be a passing fad. I'd do the mistake thing again, but I just did it so recently and I'd be doing it so many times this episode and I don't want it to become a meme because it hurt my voice. <laughs> and ended up making one of the biggest mistakes of all time. Others have argued that Sears could never have predicted the rise of e-commerce and so early on and had no choice but to axe the mail order catalog infrastructure as it was becoming unprofitable. The whole saga would take a lot more time to tell and perhaps deserves a dedicated blaze of its own one day. You know what to do if you like the idea of me shitting on Sears' business mistakes while throwing in a lot of allegedlies so I don't get sued. Uh, let me know in the comments below. Also, in five years, when Sears goes out of business, let's get together as a business blaze team. <laughs> Pool our resources and buy the Sears brand name and rename this channel Sears. <laughs> but it's still interesting to ponder that it took Amazon years to build up the kind of infrastructure that Sears already had in place. If Sears had just managed to keep the catalog going for another few years instead of tearing down the whole operation, today we could be buying all of our sh** online from Sears and Jeff Bezos would have probably been trying to flog unmarked meat in plastic carrier bags from the end of his drive. <laughs> <laughs> I get the feeling Jeff Bezos would be okay. Like, I've seen interviews with him. He's wicked smart. <laughs> Schlitz beer loses its fizz. Schlitz is a funny name. Back in the early 1900s, every classy American drank Schlitz beer. The original brewery tavern in Milwaukee, Wisconsin was founded way back in 1849 by August Krug, who hired a young guy called Joseph Schlitz as his bookkeeper. Just six years later, August Krug died and Joseph Schlitz took over the business and renamed it after himself. While he was at it, he went and married August Krug's widow. Holy sh**, dude. Someone's moving in on his turf. I'd be like, we're just gonna make sure that you didn't murder him, just to be certain. I bet he had dibs on August's pipe and slippers and smoking jacket and lawnmower too. Bet he did. Still, the flavoursome taste of Schlitz beer remains popular through the course of the 20th century. Well, things naturally went on a slight downhill trend during the Prohibition era when they had to resort to selling shitty soft drinks instead. Prohibition f***ing sucks. If someone introduced Prohibition now, I'd be like, f*** you, I am leaving. If someone did it, I'd be like, I'm leaving the country. I'm gonna go somewhere where I can drink. Or on the other hand, I'd just buy up loads of, because it went on for 10 years, right? I could buy 10 years worth of booze. That would be, I I'd manage. It'd be a lot of booze. I'd have to date one of the rooms in my studio just to booze. <laughs> but Schlitz soon bounced back and spent much of the 20th century in a tussle with Anheuser-Busch for the title of biggest beer producer in the United States. Schlitz certainly had the stronger marketing presence coming up with such famous slogans as the beer that made Milwaukee famous and when you're out of Schlitz, you're out of beer. The beer that made Milwaukee famous? Yeah, Milwaukee. It's like, it's famous. Manhattan. Hollywood. Milwaukee. I don't even know where Milwaukee is. If someone said point to Milwaukee on a map, I'd be like, I have a feeling 
and I've absolutely no idea if this is true, but it would be on the west coast and somewhere in the center. Sam, flash up how wrong I am right now. Smash that dislike button, everyone from Milwaukee. We ship merch to your location. Uh, wherever it may f be. Slightly weirdly, the naming of the brand that ran for over 150 years only really had any relevance for just under two decades. Business and wife stealer <laughs> Joseph Schlitz died at sea in 1875 when his boat hit a rock near Land's End in Cornwall. After this, the business passed back into the family of the original founder, August Krug. And it was the grandson of August Krug who had taken over the reins of the company of the 1970s and married his grandfather's wife. Not really. <laughs> But he could have. Um, she aged well. August Line maybe, decided that radical changes were needed to meet larger volume demands while cutting the cost of production. And he didn't muck about. He pretty much overhauled the entire production process. He built a new brewery in New York, which, which experimented with high temperature fermentation techniques instead of the traditional long winded brewery method. He also replaced some of the traditional ingredients with cheaper extracts and replaced some of the malted barley with a silica gel, which apparently ensured that the beer wouldn't get all hazy. I mean, all of these additional things sound a bit weird and bad, like, I don't know if I want silica gel in my food. That's the only thing I know about silica gel is that you should not eat it. It says it on every packet of it. But I mean, if it makes the beer clear, that's going to look pretty cool. And I'm like, when the beer is clear, my head is clear. I mean, not from the alcohol, but from a hangover. Like, cloudy beer f***s me up. Along the way, they lost track of the original recipe, assuming that it wouldn't be needed again in the future. Bold! This was a big shame, because there turned out to be problems with this new version of Schlitz beer. For starters, the new fermentation techniques resulted in the drink spoiling much more quickly. More importantly than that, it tasted nothing like the original and lost nearly all of its flavor, which made it famous in the first place. Mistake. Just for that extra knockout punch, Schlitz also ran a series of disastrously hostile commercials for the new beer, in which the viewer appears to get directly insulted. <laughs> Sounds like business place. People are always, I don't know why I watch this channel. Like, it's not very entertaining and I just end up getting insulted. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know why either. Smash that dislike button, you m In the series of ads, an off-screen voice from behind the camera suggests to one of three different brawny male Schlitz drinkers that he might fancy switching to the rival brand. In response, a boxer hurls abuse at the camera and threatens to punch your lights out, while a lumberjack character seems to threaten to set his pet cougar on you. The ad industry joked that the message seemed to be, drink Schlitz or I'll f***ing kill you. Daddy, chill. A bit less engaging than the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Sales quickly plummeted, and a leader of the beer industry was quickly relegated to cheap bargain bucket status. The brand was later acquired by Pabst Brewing, who finally managed to piece together the original lost recipe in 2008, but to very little fanfare. Disappointing. Gasp loses its rag, and I brought my coffee over. I forgot about my coffee, and now it's slightly cold. I don't think I've mentioned yet that I used to work at a video rental shop for about three years or so. You haven't, Danny, actually. Everyone is asking, so I, I have another channel called Biographics, which maybe you know, maybe you don't. And we do biographics of very famous people who died a long time ago throughout history. Whatever Danny mentions on there is like, we need Danny's biographics. <laughs> we need a biographics video about Danny. And it's like, that's great. And it's a great business place inside joke. But anyone who watches the biographics channel, which is like, I don't know, over a million subscribers, I think. Like, so it's bigger than this channel. They'll be like, who the f is Danny? <laughs> and why are we doing a profile of a random dude from the UK? Like, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Henry Kissinger. No, he's not dead. We haven't done him yet. Also, Henry Kissinger, not dead. <laughs> wow. Like, super famous person, super famous person, Danny. And I'm not saying you won't get there, Danny. I mean, look at this. Look at us. We're blazing every day. Every day we get bigger. The dream continues. Alas, it wasn't Blockbuster. It was a branch of a global video. It had a pretty strong presence in Scotland in the north of England for the best part of 20 years. It wasn't a bad job, but maybe not as good as some might imagine. We were never allowed to stick our own choice of film to play on the TV screen scattered around the store. We had to stick to a very strict and repetitive family-friendly playlist. Oh, God. And this is why I've now seen Toy Story 2, Spy Kids, and Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders about 2,000 times each, and I never want to see any of them ever again. I have seen... None of those. Oh, no, I think I've seen Toy Story 2, which I believe was better than Toy Story 1, right? But we were always very big on the concept of being polite to customers. And I'd like to think that a certain high-end fashion retail store in Australia called Gasp may have learned a thing or two from the far-sighted staff of Global Video. In 2011, a customer called Kira O'Neill popped into the fashion boutique on Chapel Street in Melbourne with three friends on the lookout for bridesmaid dresses and night fro and hen night frocks. They were approached by a helpful sales assistant called Chris, who initially seemed quite friendly. 
but quickly adopted a more impatient tone when the women started taking a bit of time over which dresses to try on and buy. Kira, who describes herself as having a healthy size 12 frame, I don't know what size that is. I don't understand sizes. I don't even know size 12 big. Um, I have no idea. Uh, uh, wait, I know that size zero is a thing, and that must be really skinny. So, I guess? I don't know. I don't want to offend anyone now. <laughs> She felt that Chris was becoming increasingly rude and even having a dig about her figure, okay, as he hissed things in her hair like, I think you should just get it. It's If it's the price you're worried about, just get it. With your figure, I really think you should just buy it. Chris, don't be a weirdo. The women eventually became a bit disturbed by Chris and decided to leave the store. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> Chris needs to get fired. Hashtag cancel Chris. At this point, Chris shouted after them, have fun finding something at Supra. I knew you girls were a joke the minute you walked in. I don't know what Supra is, but I assume it's a cheap store. Kira later pens a letter of complaint to the Gasp area manager, Matthew Chidley, and this would probably be a good opportunity for Matthew to offer a quick, humble apology for the staff's quite rude behavior. Quite rude behavior? If someone did this to me, I'd be like, you're firing that motherfucker. I'm a right Karen. He didn't. Instead, he sang the praises of his retail superstar employee and applied and implied that Gasp wasn't meant for Kira's kind. Oh, sh son. In response, he notes, Our product offerings are very, very carefully selected. So to ensure that we do not appeal to a broad customer base, we only carry products which appeal to a very fashion-forward consumer. These items are priced such that they remain inaccessible to the undesirable. Dude! What are you doing? Chris, who served you, is a qualified stylist with unparalleled ability who has a sixth sense for fashion. And Chris's only problem is that he's too good at what he does. He knew you were not going to buy anything before you even left your house. I respectfully ask that you sidestep our store during future window shopping expeditions. Wow, this guy's like the Michael O'Leary of fashion. You're a terrible person. This letter caused outrage when Kira posted it on social media, and there was even a thriving I Hate Gasp page set up on Facebook. The situation wasn't exactly helped when Gasp, quite bizarrely, gave permission for an internal letter to be published online. In the letter, sales assistant Chris defends his behavior to senior management by cheerfully describing Kira as a stuck-up fat bitch. I, I don't even know what to say anymore. This just get this is just getting insane. As if that wasn't enough, Matthew Chidgley gave an equally bizarre response to the media when he questions when he was questioned about the social media sh storm. He said, "This is the best thing that has ever happened to our business. We would like to thank Mrs. O'Neill from the bottom of our hearts, putting our business on the national and international stage. Notwithstanding our ill intentions, our business has experienced unprecedented sales volume, and we would like to thank you for all your assistance in helping to achieve this." He went on to state that Kira was now banned from the shop, and this strict ban extended to all her friends. Not quite sure how they'd go about enforcing that one. Despite his claims of booming business, the store on Chapel Street shortly closed afterwards when Gasp was evicted for non-payment of rent. Good! Three months later, Matthew Chidgley seemed to change his tune and made a gushing apology for his behavior on Australia's Today Tonight program, but this was largely believed to be nothing more than a last Gasp publicity stunt to generate attention for the other struggling Gasp store in town, which had resorted to a 90% discount on all the high-end stuff that was not meant to appeal to a broad customer base. Since then, the whole business has very much drawn its final breath. And I think we can all say, after this f***ing train wreck, we're all very happy about that. Sharper Image loses its cool. Sharper Image sounded like my sort of gadget shop. Founded in San Francisco in 1977, this was the kind of funky shop where you could wander around for hours and, um, and marvel at the amazing new vibrating massage chairs, okie dokie. Oh, it continues. Fancy electronic watches, motorized surfboards, bird calling robots, and bulletproof raincoats. There was a shop in the UK, I believe it was called the Gadget Shop, creatively, which I used to love as a kid. You could browse around it, they had all this crazy that appeals to kids and just not as, not as an adult. There was also a magazine called The Innovations Catalog or something. They were really creative with names in the 90s, apparently. And they had all this crazy and I was like, oh my god, I want it all. And I didn't buy it all because I was a kid. But as an adult, I was thought, oh man, I'm gonna buy everything in the Innovations Handbook. And as an adult, uh, you know, you're like, oh yeah, no, I don't, because it's all kind of shit. Never got any of that in Woolworths, although these gadgets were probably harder to sell than a couple of bags of pick and mix. By the turn of the millennium, Sharper Image had invested most of their effort into a single product called the Ionic Breeze. This was a fabulous new silent air purifier, which was a bit pricey at $229, but seemed to be performing well. At one point, it accounted for over 45% of the company's entire sales. However, Sharper Image felt a bit miffed when the non-profit product review magazine Consumer Reports ran an extensive feature on air purifiers and ranked Ionic Breeze last in all of the models that they reviewed. Consumer Reports reckon that the main problem with Sharper Image product is that it did actually purify air. It's going to be a bit of an issue when you're reviewing a air purifier, isn't it? Well, Sharper Image wasn't having any of this bullshit 
In 2003, they filed a lawsuit against Consumer Reports, claiming that the magazine had negligently disparaged the product. They're a non-profit. What do they have to gain? Unfortunately, the suit was dismissed at a cost of $525,000 in legal fees for Sharper Image, when the company had failed to come up with any evidence that the review magazine's claims were false. Sharper Image also learned a very valuable lesson. Never piss off Consumer Reports magazine. Because, just three years later, the Ionic Breeze again featured in the pages of the magazine, this time alongside claims that not only was the product totally bloody useless, it was also downright dangerous, as it emitted harmful amounts of ozone. Oh, guys, you gotta be careful who you piss off. You better watch yourself, Sharper Image, otherwise I'll blaze the out of you. Not really, allegedly, please don't sue me. Well, Sharper Image wasn't any of, any of this bullshit again. In 2007, they took Consumer Reports to court again, and they lost again. <laughs> It. it turns out the product genuinely was harmful, which meant that Sharper Image now had to spend millions of dollars on refunds and store credits, and the share price of the company plummeted. Store credits are going to be pretty useless when they, didn't they say that they specifically narrowed it down to making one product, the Ionic Breeze? So it's like, yeah, 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 we'll refund you for your Ionic Breeze, you got a store credit for $239. What can you buy for $239? Well, we have the Ionic Breeze! Within a couple of years, Sharper Image had filed for bankruptcy, closed down all of its 183 stores, laid off 4,000 employees, and sold the brand name to Camelot Venture Group. They should have just put more effort into bird calling robots. They sounded quite cool. All right then, bird calling robots though, that Duck Dynasty thing, I've never seen it, but I think maybe I listened to a podcast about it or something. These dudes made a fortune just making fucking whistles for ducks. It's like shit. What am I doing with my life? WT Grant loses its mind. Finally. There can be only one gold medal winner in this ultimate countdown of the Corporate Darwin Awards. Although I think I said that last time, and I'll probably say it again in part three. Yeah, you will, Danny, because this video is gonna get the views! Uh, since 1906, WT Grant, or Grants for short, had been a successful chain of cheap and cheerful merchandise stores scattered across the United States. The chain essentially sold any old shit to customers who weren't too fussy, and they were doing pretty good business. By 1936, Grants was pulling in annual sales of around $100 million, whilst by the middle of the 20th century, the annual num the number of stores had grown to a peak of 1,200. But things proved to be more challenging in the late 1960s, as Grants started to lose ground to new kids on the block like Kmart, who were building more modern and friendly stores in more desirable and practical locations. But Grants had a fiendishly cunning plan to entice their old customers back into their stores. Employees and managers were incentivized to offer new company credit cards to as many customers as possible. So now every single customer that walked through the doors of this decidedly low-rent outfit was given an opportunity to buy as much as they liked without having to worry about how they were going to pay for it later on. Dude, if you're getting a credit card and you're not worrying about how you're going to pay for it later on, what the f*** are you doing? Tear up that application right now, son. <laughs> oh, loser. Uh, nice try, man. The bill could just be shoved onto their shiny new Grants credit cards, which were happily issued without the slightest assessment on the customer's ability to repay a debt. For extra fun, there wasn't much in the way of centralized control, so a customer could wander into a branch of Grants, rack up a massive bill on their credit card, then wander over to another branch of Grants and claim an entirely separate credit card to abuse. <laughs> and to further incentivize any store managers who weren't pulling their weight in thrusting credit cards in the faces of customers who might well struggle to afford paying back what they spend, a plan was formed to intentionally humiliate these staff at company functions. Any manager who had failed to meet their quota would be served beans instead of steak, would get a custard pie in their face, and would have their tie cut off, or would sometimes even have to wear a diaper for the entire function. These people must be massively unemployable, because if I was in that situation, and there was even the threat of doing that, I'd be like, uh, I'm just gonna go work as a manager at any other store that is not a steaming pile of shit, allegedly. Not surprisingly, very few managers failed to hit their targets. Actually, this is I've changed my mind. This is I'm going to motivate Dan. Danny, I need four scripts a week, or I'm going to cut your tie. Danny wishes he had a tie. All this sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. The surprising part of this story is that the first couple of years didn't go too badly. Only a tiny fraction of customers defaulted on their debts, helped in part by the fact that the U.S. economy was going through a boom period at the time. But when the economic expansion began to slow down in the 1970s, Grant's strategy, a free credit for everyone, went tits up a bit. Grant's ended up with $800 million worth of unrecoverable debt on their hands and were still determined to perse persevere with exactly the same strategy for, for a few more years. The company finally collapsed under the weight of its own credit losses in 1976. It would be nice to think that on the final day of business, all the corporate fools involved in these decisions were marched around each and every store in handcuffs and baby grows while the employees threw rotten eggs at their faces, but I suspect that didn't happen. 
Grant sadly never came back for a sequel, but that's maybe no surprise. As Schlitz Beer may have put it, when you're out of your mind, you're out of business. But a bomb bomb. This has been Business Blaze, the Corporate Darwin Awards Part 2. I've been Simon. This has been my spacey to Charles. Danny wrote the script, Sam added the memes, and thank you for watching. Perch the Merch. Co. Nice.